Thank you very much. So at this point, we're just gonna take a short break. Several people came in and left and I've been messaging, so you may be seeing me and I hope that some of them will be in, but already we have um, Dr. Sinus on online. And if you don't mind, we'll just wait two minutes or so to see if uh, those people, one person is in China. So I don't know if he's having trouble reconnecting. I'm gonna try calling him. And then we'll go ahead with the comments from the audience. Professor Orser was also online, but I think she stepped off. So let me see, I don't know why. Um, so let's, I'm just gonna make a few calls if you don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, Can I take leave? Yes, because I know that you have to leave, Rima. Thank you very much. So we sh we'll find an opportunity to speak next week um, because we have a number of things to follow up on as well, okay? It's such an honor to meet you, all of you, Professor Easy, Governor Andrew. Thank you, Rima. Thank, Thank you. Pleasure, Thank you, it's a pleasure. It was, uh, it was nice meeting you and I hope to, that we can meet again and share. Yeah, inshallah, definitely. Thank you. I'll be back in two. Okay, it seems as though France has stepped off. Let me see Barbara. <laughs> I don't know what happened, uh, why. Maybe there was a miscommunication. I thought it was pretty clear, but... Uh, Several people I spoke with them yesterday and they were all excited saying we <laughs> really want to be part of this, so. Hello, Professor. Hi, sweetheart. Are you planning to join us? Okay, no, no, but we, we, I saw you on, but then you've gone. So were you gonna join? We are just about to start the discussion part now. Let me just wait. Sorry. It should be another uh, five minutes. Yeah, we shouldn't be much longer. Uh, Professor Orser is going to get back on, and I'm just going to reach out to one other person, and then I think we go. Just in case they have questions to the panel. Yesterday, in the other session that we recorded, we had, Angela, how many people? We had 12 people or something in the audience? Hi, were you planning to join the discussion? Okay. Okay, okay then, bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay, we'll just wait one minute and then uh, Professor Orser was gonna get on and then uh, I think we can. We can figure it out if not. Okay, um, I suggest we just proceed. <laughs> and since we have um, Sinus, uh, would you like to please introduce yourself, Sinus? Dr. Orsa just joined as well. And um, any comments or questions that you have for the um, audience, Sinus, please proceed. Is your... Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name is Sainath Banerjee. I'm uh, an anthropologist by training. <clears throat> I'm currently working with, uh, as a consultant with Asian Development Bank, New Delhi, India, to support uh, national urban health mission uh, of, uh, to the government of India. It's a pan-India program, which is being implemented in 1,000 plus cities across India. So uh, 
thank you for this very rich and interesting you know discussion uh, no specific questions but i have a kind of comment uh, from uh, reema ji's you know a follow up comment what when she talked about that you know uh, we have to have depend on the local uh, production local consumption and okay. which is supported by dr alex that we need to develop the capacity locally <clears throat> now i i just wanted to you know reflect on the urbanization concept especially in in asian context and indian context i see the whole urbanization process is very artificial it's uh, it's taken an example of bangalore of, or maybe a satellite township near delhi called gurgaon uh, which was 20 years back was a sleepy village of haryana state and then there was a suddenly you know automobile industry came software engineering department came and other people it's attracted the attentions of whole lot of people from outside and as a result of that it pushed the local people at the periphery of the city so what happens to the city as a result of that the new rich community they started depending on all the utility private utility and less on the public public sector so if they 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 want to have drink water they are consuming the water they are collecting water and taking water from the shops the bottled water and the the public utility services as a result is going weak it is also equally applicable for public health service delivery so what is happening a city which is completely depend on the artificial kind of an system which is not focused to develop a robust you know public health delivery system then when the uh, a disease like covid appear the whole private sector surrender give up to the that particular pandemic and with a weak public health care delivery they are not in a position to respond the crisis so so and now i just wanted to you know so what would be the kind of call for action as uh, in in continuation to the reema ji and alex what they said i just wanted to add one dimension that we need to have to have local planning and local capacity building to address you know this kind of crisis in future thank you very much um <coughs> professor orser any comments or questions from you to the panel and please introduce yourself <laughs> oh thank you uh, the name is barb orser and i am calling in from ottawa canada i'm a board member of way and a full professor at the university of ottawa telfer school of management and my work has examined women's entrepreneurship in north america and the middle east and uh my interest and and question actually two uh the first the first is and perhaps um the governor might speak to this and i see rima is not on the panel but in terms of policy and program support at this time in response to covid uh 19 what would you like to see introduced to support the micro informal and women entrepreneurs in your communities and coupled with that what is the role of universities and post secondary institutions because you did mention that in your comments so what might we do including business schools to address some of these needs just the development in markets professor and you uh, governor angelo uh, uh, thank you so much i personally think that uh, from what i've seen and from experience um policies that we have we have said that we must empower women and this is the time that we can actually show meaningfully that we can support women by training them and 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 having them to access markets for what they are producing right now we have market i cannot even meet the market for at the moment the ppes uh, that we are producing right now the masks that i'm producing right now and although in the past we have helped women with 
empowerment funds, we never co connected the empowerment funds with the market. And that's why I'm today saying that we have the market, not just from COVID a challenge that we have. I had already connected the women with the production of uniform for our officers, you know, our police, our, uh, you, you, you know, our defense forces, among others. But I need to connect more now with the international community. Last year, I visited Dallas. And Dallas saw the things that we are connecting here. And we got certificate of export processing. And now I need to continue training them so that they can make high quality that can meet the international market. And that way they'll be able to sustain themselves and their families. My cue, the young women that I'm training are not even going to school beyond primary education, but they're making very good comments. So we need now technology and market training, building skills. For me, um, you know, Mar you know, Margot, women have been lip service for far too long. Let us now do something so that it is sustainable for them. They can take care of their families, take care of their children. When they elected me in 2017, they told me, let your leadership change our lives. I'm not, they are not expecting handouts at all. They are expecting me to show them what to do, where the market is, and they'll be able to go on their own. So what we need right now is to get them more trained. I want to train over a thousand women. We have them, they have come forward and I need the machines. Like now I need, you, you know, stitching machines. I have the certificate from our Kenya Bureau of Standards to stitch even mosquito nets. I know after this COVID and after the rains that you have had, we are going to have malaria. I need to prepare myself. I need to start making mosquito nets. Mosquito nets honestly do not have to come from US or from China or from Japan. They can come from Kitui. They can made in Kitui, my county, and I supply. And these women will have some uh, sustainable way of living with their families and money in their pockets. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. I, I, I say I do not want to be given handouts you know, that we have uh, put safety nets for you for this night time. And then what happens next year? I, I want to be helped so that I can help my women and my young people to move. And so, Barbara, I guess from your perspective, part of that training on entrepreneurship skills and yes. um, ability to understand markets and their demands would be very yes. integral. And the quality, and the quality. Yes, quality. You ensure that we have we, we produce quality and ensure that they have the understanding of work ethic, you know, work ethic that they can go and work and go home. Um, when next time I'm talking to you, I'll send you a video to see our our plan in the factory where we are working, our plan where we are training these young people, women and men, to do the construction of roads, construction of houses. And we just want to ensure that uh, we can also start producing the raw materials. The materials are all very expensive. They're coming from outside the country. And that makes the PPEs and the masks very expensive for even people to use, uh, to buy them. And I cannot afford to give them for free. Uh, and, and that's how it is, the support that we can get. Um, when we talk about empowering women, for me, it's not money for them to go and do business. It's for them to be able to produce and to have a steady market so that they can sell their goods and their products. Okay. Thank you very much. Very can I come in uh, slightly on this? Um, I think just two quick points. One, uh, to Senate's point about the gaps in public infrastructure and, and services. I think it is very uh, clear within urban settings and across sub, uh, sub Saharan Africa. The African Development Bank estimates that uh, the funding gap for infrastructure uh, funding gap in Africa is to the tune of about $107 billion every year. 
So Africa doesn't have maybe 70% of the money it needs to invest in infrastructure each year. And from some analysis they did, over, uh, since 1980, if you look at the per capita growth in infrastructural uh, investments and, and stock of infrastructure, many African countries have actually regressed that we have far less today than we did in, in 1980. And so we have had very rapid growth in our population. And I think that's one of the challenges we have in Africa that we also have to address in many ways. If we are going to double the population from 1.2 billion now to 2.4 billion by 2050, which is in 30 years, it means we have to also double everything we need. The number of schools, teachers, hospitals, doctors, nurses, every, roads, houses, and all of those in order to maintain the current levels of inadequate coverage of these services. And we don't have, to have those resources. And when we don't invest in those basic services that build the human capital, then we do not reap the benefits of that large population in some ways. Now, to the point that uh, has been made with respect to how do we support this local entrepreneurship, you know, the experience of many countries that have industrialized is that when they started, nobody thought anything of their products. You think of the 1970s and 80s, made in Taiwan was like a fake. Made in China 20 years ago was like fake. And that's how you define fake materials. Today, everything in your house is made in China. And I think for us is to start somewhere. And I congratulate again, uh, 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 Governor Gillo for taking that boat step. If we can produce what we need and we start from there, and then we link this local production to our knowledge systems and universities. So we can actually introduce innovation and improvement in the quality of these products and materials. Then it moves from just meeting the local demand to meeting the national Sorry. demand and regional demand. And what we have seen is the huge disconnect between our local uh, academic and knowledge institutions and some of the <laughs> local activities that we are taking. So we do the same thing that we've been doing for 20, 30, 40 years without improving on the quality of those okay. and, the pro and, and the processing and the value addition and all of those. And in that case, we begin to lose momentum and ground as other people copy that, improve on it, and make it better than we're able to make it. So finding ways to connect these local innovations and local productions to our knowledge institutions so that they can actually look at them test better materials that we can use locally, test better ways of producing them in, with better quality and all of those. I think we can move forward in a much more strategic and coordinated way in building that capacity at the local mm -hmm. level. Yes, thank you for that. Fernando, any thoughts based on your observations in, in Latin America? Um, yeah, well, I, I just want to make a point that while I completely agree with the members of the panel and some of the questions that we need to strengthen and see things happening at the local level in terms of empowerment. We should not let off the hook to other levels, the nation state level and the global multilateral institutions. Uh, one thing is to say we need to see these things happen at the local level and we need empowerment at the local level. But public goods and merit goods are not simply built at the local level. I mean, you do require this is not about handouts, as, as it was mentioned, but you do require pooling of resources at the nation and at the global level to reach those local communities. Otherwise, we are simply trying to solve things at a level that, while needed, is impossible to do it by itself. I, I do agree, and it's wonderful and uh, encouraging the kind of actions that are being taken at the local level. But Latin America learned this lesson the hard way, and it is that to change relative prices, to create infrastructure projects, to develop the capacity at the local level, you need the resources and the redistribution of capacity of the state nation, our nation state, and we need the multilateral Gov governance institutions to step in so that redistribution between countries also takes place. That doesn't take anything away from my complete agreement that 
the local level is where we should be looking at for things to happen and for empowerment to take place. But this requires an alliance with the nation state and with the global institution. Fully agree, fully agree. Because at the end of the day, it's about making the pie bigger for everybody so that everybody yeah. is better off. And if communities start that momentum, then the onus is on the national government to ensure that there's coherence and that the policy measures are aligned to support that. The other part of this also, I think that there is um, what I hear from the governor in terms of access to markets is in parallel, and Barbara, you probably would agree, is being able to tap into global value chains because that's where the Chinese succeeded at the end of the day. Yes. And that's yes. why they have the markets. And they were able to establish their role and their value in the global value chain structure. So it's, it's a stage where that production capacity in China is critical for production capacity in other countries. And um, so, Barbara, I, I, from an entrepreneurial perspective, I think also there is a role for the global private sector. There's yes. a role for the national um, private entities. And we need to, to link those things because that's how the small producer can then leverage that power to access international markets, uh, given the way in which the global trading system is, is, has been developed. I'd certainly appreciate a perspective on how uh, the state, the regional, and the national governments can deploy public procurement. Uh, we see very mixed results uh, around the world. Uh, I think the corporate sector through supplier diversity is, is far outpacing government. And um, I'm just wondering about your experiences and thoughts about better deploying strategically the, the buying power of your, your governments. Seems as though Governor and Julie has figured out a way to tap into some of those procurement, <laughs> uh, uh, procurement activities. But are you succeeding in doing it at the national level, Governor, Governor and Julie? When you yes, apply yes, the can to the military, is that coming yes. from a national level? Yes, it's coming. The fact, the, the, the fact that we put this uh, uh, garment production industry here and the fact that I knew that this uniform was coming from outside the country, I was able to go and say, this is government to government. Kitui County is a government and therefore I can supply direct and you pay us. So I increase my revenue here. I employ more people. I'm saying that... Uh, you know, China is now a very developed country, so they should be buying much more from us than us buying from them. I will get the machines from them, but eventually I do hope, and I hear what um, Professor Elsa is saying, that truly anything that was made in China 20 years ago was fake in Africa. But now everything in our homes is made in China, made in Taiwan, made in Japan. I am looking for a day when things made in Kitui will get into the markets in Europe. And I have every reason to believe that will be done. I'll train young people, they'll make quality, I'll use the machines. Uh, I'm soon hoping that I can get to UN and New York and say that our mosquito nets from Kitui will be supplied in the region and that mosquito nets will not come from uh, and from Turkey and from Japan, they can come from Kitui. That is how I'm going to employ more people. Women must now be given that kind of support who are doing the work. Any uh, final comments or questions from the from our community here? I think, um, let me just make my final comment because we also are now looking at uh, lockdown by six o'clock. We must all go home and it's now six o'clock here. Okay. Saying that um, from the World Bank, any, any support you really give to us, let us show you the results that we want and the planning that you have put in place so that you can give us the support not putting money before we show you what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve it and within what time. 
if that is done, I think uh, we African women will be better off and will be happier. And then clear monitor monitoring. You can monitor what we are doing, but first and foremost, give us the knowledge. I feel confident with these young women, so many of them going home happily because they got the knowledge to do the work that they are doing. They make the very good masks that every Kenya, Kenyan now is asking for it. Since I do not have the capacity here in Kitui, they are still bringing some more masks from, uh, uh, from uh, China. I wish I could have the machine to produce the highest number and these women continue to produce other garments and other products. I uh, thank you so much once again for putting us in this forum. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to Professor Orser and uh, Sinus Banerjee, Dr. Banerjee, also for contributing to the discussion. Thank you again and look forward to being in touch. I will send a follow up note and uh, so you can be informed on how to access the, the recording. Thank you. 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 Thank